to the next episode of the Parenting Podcast. And I'm super excited to share with you today that I have got Catherine McKenzie Baxter with me. Catherine is a mum of three um, who is an incredible yoga teacher uh, and has her business, Yoga Needs Yoga, which I highly recommend anybody to go and check out. And I asked Catherine to come onto the podcast today because we have connected over the years through similar experiences would that be kind of fair to say Catherine yes I think I would agree with that yeah we've both got NICU babies haven't we yes yeah Yeah. and I and I kind of wanted to ask you you know how how you feel about those kind of things in retrospect your experience at the time so tell me about your three amazing children who are just adore (laughs) well they're really growing up now which I can't get my head around so I've got the eldest he's in year six he's 11 Edwin I can't believe that I just really I can't I really can't I'm really excited for the future but I also can't cope with the fact I have an 11 year old (laughs) got number two Una my daughter she is eight she's going to be nine also astonishing to me that I've Mm. almost you know decade on from her being born and then my youngest Wilfred who is he's just turned seven So 7, 8 and 11, Uh, it's nice that they're not all under the age of, I think I had like three under the age of four or something ridiculous when they were little. tough. It was really tough, like overwhelmingly tough. I'd say Mm. years of recovery (laughs) was taken to get over that period of time. As I'm sure any parent with lots of little ones understands, it's, yeah. It's sort of that's that's hard those are hard times and it's interesting like even though they're independent now it's a whole other thing that you're dealing with like you go you move away from wiping bottoms and keeping them alive and all that stuff yeah how dealing with them as individuals in the world and how mm. to navigate that that's huge so scary yeah, yeah. It's really scary because you're like, oh, okay, something's coming up here. Something about my past being incorporated into what you're telling me that's triggering me. Yeah. On a second. And it's really revealing, actually. It's really, really revealing. It has a lot, a lot of the responses we have to our children's difficulties or whatever comes up is tied into our experience as children, Mm. teenagers and whatever. So it's really fascinating grounds for exploration. Yeah. (laughs) It yeah. is. You're so right. And, uh, you know, as you move through each of these stages, like you say, you know, with having the smaller ones and having three of them and having different kind of um, needs to kind of deal with in- included in that, that throws up its own things. But in each of their developmental stages, their age stages, their social stages, there's going to be so much that we're just not prepared for. <laughs> I speak for that. I'll own myself yeah. for that one. I mean- we would be mad to be pre- prepared for it because if we're prepared yeah. for something, something else is going to come. Mm-hmm. It's going to be the opposite of what we expect. So, you yeah. know, you're damned if you try and prepare for any of it, I think. You yeah. just look at it moment to moment and go, okay, so this is happening now. I'm not ready for this. This is fine. <laughs> and that's yeah. starting. Yeah. It's a roller coaster, isn't it? Yeah. These, it's That's life, you know. And I have to say, I think we've definitely had, like, compared to a lot of people's experiences with younger kids, we've definitely had the roller coaster experience um, with the stuff that came up. And I have to say, like, at no point did I have a very um, clear idea of how I was going to meet adult life. And life just happened. (laughs) And life happened. And it, um, yeah, everything comes up just to challenge you. And you have to rise to those challenges, you know, whatever it is. Um, yeah, you know for me particularly it was having um so I had my first when I was 25 26 mm-hmm. living in London um you know sort of a post art student life trying to make enough money to be an artist live that kind of creative lifestyle um settling into jobs and things and then I I, I got pregnant and had a child with a sort of guy that I was with for about a year and it was just meant to be actually I got very excited about the idea of having this luggage on the tube which was a child you know in a sling and that was <laughs> luggage I want, that. I want to join in this seems like fun I think basically what happened is I was moving away from creating art and thought I want to create a child and that is art art is life so you know these kind of high fluid fluid uh-huh. ideas crazy ideas but anyway I had my first um yeah and that wasn't straightforward 
it was not straightforward. We lived in Hackney at the time, really mm-hmm. expensive rent. Knew that, well, I didn't know what I was going to do about going back to work, but I knew work was like six changes away in terms of public transport. And that was really hard when I was pregnant to do the walk to the station, get the tube. It was an overground, then get an underground, then get another underground, then get another tube or an overground and then a bus and then get to work. So it was like an hour and 45 to get to work, but 30 weeks pregnant. So I was working at Wimbledon Park for a fine art logistics company but living in on Chatsworth Road in Homerton, there is no sense. That's just not sensible. No one lives there <laughs> in East London and goes yeah. to work all the way down to South London. It's meant to be accessible. <laughs> meant to be like easy when you no, but it wasn't. It was madness. <laughs> so yeah, so I had Eddie and I had all those amazing ideals about um, hypnobirthing and natural birth. Uh, yeah, breastfeeding sling slash luggage situations you know we didn't have a car or anything don't need it in London do you really uh-huh. not you know. all those tubes and overgrounds and underground absolutely <laughs> all the joys and the fun uh yeah so yeah and then when I think I went back to work eventually after doing some voluntary work with the NCT because I was definitely in that headspace of like uh one child idealism <laughs> uh you know doing yoga with my baby in the lounge and then doing this breastfeeding peer support work, which was like voluntary work, but a little bit paid. Mm. Somehow got into the NCT, even though I decided the NCT was too sort of upper middle class for me. Mm. So I didn't actually do the NCT when I was pregnant. I don't know why I made that decision, but it worked for me. I did hypnobirthing instead. So yeah, and then, so I did, you know, bits and pieces, which um, were, were amazing. Well, then I went back to work and I was basically demoted from my role as a kind of client manager of Christie's mainly, but for galleries and stuff, shipping. Mm. It's just an absurd job. Shipping really expensive pieces of work around the world and getting it sometimes lost in a warehouse in LA and being like, can you not lose this Klaus Oldenburg piece, please? Because it's like a few million, that kind of experience. But so when I went back to work, because I couldn't do all of the hours, because I was trying to fit it around James's work at the RA at that time, um, I was downstairs, a bit like a secretary. Mm. And I really didn't like that. And then in that period of time, I got pregnant. But I was also doing um, a yoga teaching course in London at that time. I got pregnant with my second while I was doing some training. Oh. Um, so... Yeah, so I would have been about 27, 28. And it turned out fairly quickly into that pregnancy. I think I knew I was pregnant at four weeks or something stupidly early. Crazy. I just had the feel, you know, once you've had one, you sort yeah. of know, you, you've kind of touched into that. So, yeah, I think I was, um, yeah, I found out I was pregnant really early. But I went to a scan and because I was sort of cavalier about the process, having had a child, went up to the scan on my own with my son. 10 weeks uh and it's very very small at 10 weeks isn't it Mm. and like at that scan I was trying to keep Eddie happy with satsumas because he ate a lot of satsumas at that time (laughs) I told some really unfortunate news um so I remember the woman trying to sort of break it to me that this baby had a birth defect um and yeah so she sort of tried to explain and I think she told me about the birth defect at that time but I went into a kind of Uh, a disbelief sort of mode I think I went into a bit of shock because it was like ultimately I was like well this is what I I wasn't expecting this I was Mm. expecting it to be straightforward I'm here with my one-year-old one and a half year old not being able to take on board the information Uh, and obviously I was on my own without James so I distinctly remember that and coming out of this appointment having told being told I had this birth defect and what that meant I think that's when they told me I had the gastroschisis, which is quite common now. Mm. Um, and sort of going out onto uh, Fulham Road and just sort of freaking out, um, basically, and obviously ringing up people and being like, I don't know what's going on. And I've got a lot of like voids in my memory of that time. Mm. I remember the conversations we had and I remember how it escalated. And I remember that we were given a specific consultant that you know, would write articles for one of these private gynecology magazines around Chelsea area. And he was our consultant. And the first appointment we had with him, he was just staring at his phone. And when he looked at us on the bed, even though we'd been told this information about this birth defect, 
And I was expecting a counselling session, I'll be honest with you. <laughs> expecting someone to be really professional and he was just staring at his phone I don't know looking at some private yeah I don't know yeah I couldn't understand that and I sort of you know it, it kind of got to a point where I think we got like 20 weeks maybe late 20 weeks early yeah it was late 20 weeks in and they hadn't really said you know um they hadn't said anything about it being that awful They'd said I could have a, a natural delivery about 37 weeks plus. And because um, I kept pressing them because I'm the sort of person who wants to know what to expect. It's yeah. about expectation management, isn't it? Like a lot of life. <laughs> yeah, I'm this, you know, I'm the same. Yeah, I, I want my expectations to be low. So I'm not like surprised and I can deal yeah. with that situation at hand. Um, and I was, are you sure I can have a natural delivery? Because, you know, you've told me that the intestine is outside of the body. And, and the stomach's outside of the body and whatnot you know everything's kind of not inside when it should be because it should be absorbed gestationally like a lot of the internal organs are outside of the fetus and they kind of get absorbed in at seven eight weeks or something and basically that didn't happen with una no. for whatever reason you know and i've heard loads of different things like there are higher rates of gastroschisis for people who live closer to like army barracks was one of them and i was like mm-hmm what does that even mean has that got something to do with pollution or is that lifestyle thing because I was again trying to do the research like yeah. figure it all out why have I got this yeah. high rates and younger parents I was 27 28 at the time I wouldn't necessarily say I was a young parent yeah. um you know trying to make sense of it all but we did get to the point where it was proceeding to be that bad a a case of gastroschisis it ended up being a complicated gastroschisis they call it and it was one of one of the more severe types that they'd seen they said he said he just turned around it's like the first time he'd spoken to us you know weeks and weeks in to all of these consultations and her growth had like never it would just petered off it was awful on the chart mm. and you know like the the amniotic fluid was being absorbed by the bowel that was outside of the fetus and all this sort of thing. Um, yeah, and he was like, have you thought about aborting the child? And it was beyond the legal limit. So it was obviously a really bad case. And I was just like, no, you know, not when you get to this point. No. And you've got to, you know, t- 28 weeks or something. And that hadn't been explained to you or brought up with you? No, <laughs> absolutely not. Hadn't it been explained? When they just had said, oh, you should be able to have a natural delivery after yeah. 37 weeks, like it was no big deal, maybe to reduce anxiety. But again, but that's not part of my expectation management. <laughs> yeah, wow. Um, there were lots of situations in that process where it was like, okay, that person's not communicating to the consultant of NICU that had a conversation with us. It doesn't link up and you're in the hands of whoever that person happens to be in that room at any given time. Yeah. I think for most of those appointments, I don't know, I, I think James was there, but I can't really remember. I remember him being there for maybe one or two of them, but maybe a lot of the time I was on my own. Um, and you are vulnerable. Yeah. But I have to say you are a little bit vulnerable when you haven't got your other half there. Yeah. And I can't believe that. I can't believe that that should be the case, but it is. And it's more and more, it's become more and more obvious to me as I've gone through the process of being a parent, being a mum, having complicated children, how important it has been to have my partner there sat standing next to me to back me up because oh my god you just uh, you don't get treated with the same respect sometimes we spoke about that the other day didn't we and I completely agree um Mm -hmm. and I think that's why I'm such a tiger mum like I'm people see me as so overbearing because you know I I feel like we have the same right to be heard and seen and explained to and discussed with rather than having to have a separate person to like you say back you up like that's just it's just horrific that you've had to you know experience experience that so they tell you that you know or ask you have you considered this this termination and then where did your head go I mean, I think that, so James and I had had a conversation about uh, complex needs with children when Eddie, when I was pregnant with Eddie, we had the Down syndrome conversation 
to figure out our, where we stood with things. It's like, okay, I mean, which is really interesting when you think about it, that you then end up with complications. And it was always like, we feel that we wouldn't want to make that decision because you can't make that decision in life because you can't know. So it's that unknowingness that we were like, okay, so we embraced the unknowing. You don't know what you're going to be presented with. That person who's telling you something doesn't really know either. So you just have to go with a gut reaction and that's going to be, well, just it's okay. You can't make that decision. Obviously, anyone can make that decision. It's up to that person. It's choice. It's all about choice where you are in life with that. And um, yeah, so so yeah, it was kind of a, a bit of a, we didn't even have to think about it, actually. We just were like, well, we've had this conversation, but in a different yeah. context. And it still holds to a certain extent. Which is amazing. It's a testament to kind of your communication and and your relationship that, you know, that's the decision, come what may. Yeah, and that's actually been the most amazing thing about our sort of union has been that on the really big themes, the big, those themes, life, death, ethics, we are together on that. Yeah. We might disagree and we might be opposites on everything else. <laughs> but amazingly, we do come from the, we're reading from the same page, which is great. Mm-hmm. Um, and we have actually, I mean, like we, we're we very lucky in terms of the fact that James has his Buddhist practice and faith that really has, it was very strong mm-hmm. from when he started because he's so disciplined. Um, from when Eddie was born, mm-hmm. I think that's when he really began to meditate regularly. And then I had this kind of yoga background and philosophy, which also is very similar to Buddhist Buddhism and yoga. They cross over, they interweave completely. So that has also been at the forefront of all of our decision making. So, you know, lucky us. And with Una, because we had a child that was healthy and had an understanding of what was normal and what kind of expectations we should have, that also really helped with the process of having Una. Because yeah. I knew what to fight for and I knew not to get institutionalized because I was seeing these parents who hadn't had kids before and they were, their their kind of expectations of what the child should be doing. They were it's just they didn't have that compa- like that comparison to make. Mm. I was really lucky she wasn't number one, is what I'm saying. Like I I'm releasing my episode of the podcast uh, tomorrow of my mm-hmm. podcast. Um, and everything that you have just said then I literally said in my podcast I became so yeah. institutionalized so you know this the, the way we are with NICU and again you know having not had an experience of a, a, a healthy term baby you know mm-hmm. these things then kind of knock you sideways and mm-hmm. then to kind of have to navigate that kind of path that's incredibly difficult but for you to to do that with a child already around you know that that's got to be tough tough yeah I think it made it harder because it was more excruciating for that reason I did mental prep in terms of getting my head around incubators because of the kangaroo care thing being opposite so when I was the breastfeed so I set up this training for breastfeeding supporters and we trained up 13 mums in a sure start center I organized all of it and we got you know we got a breastfeeding counselor to do that and we all had our squishy boobs our knitted boobs still got one of them someone knitted it I've still got it and you know just to help mums with let down you know and all of that because it was so hard for me in the first it just didn't come on automatically breastfeeding nightmare you know I was writing down times every minute throughout the night and it just wasn't working for me you know and I did have one person step in. It was the manager of um, James's manager at the RA who rang me. We had a conversation. She was get in the bath, have a glass of wine. She was a breastfeeding counsellor. And that really helped. Yeah. It was just one person. It wasn't a family member. It was just a rat. You know, it was that connection that really helped me. So when I was at NICU, one of my placements was at Chelsea and Westminster NICU. And I knew that I had a child with a birth defect, albeit a little one. Mm-hmm. So I was in NICU offering breastfeeding support to mums in special care but also going so I'm going to be in here there are incubators over there they're yeah. really weird that's a bit like being on a spaceship that's everything the antithesis of how I feel like I want to parent but I had to get my head around it and be like this is fine you yeah. can do this you can have your child an incubator it's not a big deal <laughs> you know I was going through that at the same time it was like a little um 
like mission into that area to just kind of get to grips with what I had in store because they said three months or six to 12 weeks or something was kind of the expected period yeah and we'll go you know we'll go through it we'll go through ITU HDU and end up in special care and we'll be out like all of them you know like all the babies should yeah and you it'll know, be very easy was not that that was and not then that. after that that's your journey done forever goodbye yeah. off you go graduate oh, yeah. it's fine off you go uh, apparently no actually that doesn't always happen <laughs> it's like doesn't yeah we really went my, my daughter was in hospital solidly for 11 and a half months before mm. she came home to us um so yeah that was not six to 12 weeks no and then obviously you know you, you're trying to manage being a mum at home as well as being a mum in a hospital and your day-to-day -day life how how do you juggle all of that? Could you take Eddie with you? Did you have to separate time from Una? Like that's so much to carry. I was in there for quite a while after the C-section, um, recovering, but she was also having many surgeries that were going wrong. And then she was, I mean, basically said goodbye to her at one point. She was sort of dying um, throughout that period of time. When I came out of the C-section, I went in and there were like 15 people in that room. I was like a guinea pig. They all wanted to see the special, the C-section that brought out the gastroschisis baby because it's great training for them. Right. It was, you know, one of those. And um, I didn't see Una when she came out. They cut me open larger than I needed. Well, because they didn't want to cut through the yeah. intestine. But James had his camera over the blue sheet. So we've got these ridiculous photographs and they are ridiculous because it looks like, you know, all of her guts, as she's pulled out, wow. all of her guts are on the outside of her body oh dangling from the baby being held. She's screaming and she looks like a baby. For some reason, because she came prematurely because everything, you know, tailed off, she was too small and she everything was going wrong. So they pushed it as late as possible. But I thought she wouldn't be formed properly in my head. I had it in my head that she wouldn't be a fully formed baby, but yeah. she was fully formed. And I was yeah. like, thank God for that. You know, because you have a tiny version of it. Yeah. Yeah. She's like, oh, she's still a baby. She's just really, really, really small. But I didn't get to meet her, didn't get to see her, just got the photographs and she mm -hmm. got whisked off. My C section wasn't great because even though my BMI is of a certain level, I react really strongly to any of the drugs they give you. So I got basically had a bit of a near-death experience in that c-section where they had to pump me full of adrenaline to bring me back they were losing me oh my God. So I've got a very distinct memory of that <laughs> it was fun um and then they whisked her off to have surgery so what they wanted to do was they wanted to pack the bowel the stomach the ovaries all of it into her tiny little body where the stuff had never grown because her body, so, because it had never been in her body. Yeah. So her body didn't have the capacity to take the organs. Yeah. And I reasoned with them, but as a parent, they don't necessarily go to the parent and go, do you think we should do this? Or do you think we should do that? Because yeah. I would have had an opinion. <laughs> I would have definitely. Why would you? Yeah, you don't know, you're not medical, how dare you? Yeah, but actually, like sometimes parents have quite a good idea of what the right thing would, might be. Um, the gastroschisis baby that the surgeon had done just before Una, they had just piled everything back into the body and it was fine sewn it up oh. surprise surprise it didn't work for una so they tried to do that and um yeah so basically she got compartmental syndrome where the blood to the extremities the fingers toes gets cut off because mm. the center the torso is like overwhelmed um so bless una she's lost the end of her little finger from it because what happened is her fingers went dusky and grey and obviously the amazing Malaysian nurses in the IT unit, ITU unit were like, well, uh, this is going on. You know, mm. her body, uh, it just, it didn't look right at all. So they had, I think the, I think she didn't even get taken to theatre. She was still on the morphine from the first surgery. They proceeded to have a second surgery to reverse what they'd done and take it all out and put it in a silo, a Baxter bag, that's our name, Baxter, the classic Baxter bag. Love it. Left it on top of her belly. Mm. And then that started uh, necrotizing. So you yeah. might have had neck with Premi babies. Right. Basically the bowel dies. That's what happened. And she had number three surgery. This is within 24 hours. 
before number three surgery, I think they wheeled me out to say goodbye because they said she's probably not going to make it. She was orange. She was pumped full of fluids, so she was massive. And you could see her veins. And uh, like I just remember being wheeled over like the little thresholds to get mm. into NICU, and it really hurt to see yeah. sexual scar. Well, <laughs> you know, like, right yeah. But so when I said to the nurse, because you're in like this adrenaline mode, and I said, because she obviously hadn't been registered, I was like, but can she have a funeral if she is, hasn't been registered, was what I asked the nurse. The nurse didn't know what we'd been told, so she obviously thought I was, she was like, why is she asking that question about her baby? But it was because we had been taken aside from surgeon who'd done surgery two, because surgeon one, they'd taken the baby away from that surgeon, said, let's try another surgeon. And then the surgeon who did number two, three, four, five, six, seven surgeries on from then was another guy, Simon Clark, different kind of level. He's really, really interesting character, the way he does things, because surgeons cut their kind of emotional, they're not emotional beings. Mm. Going in and they're cutting up your child and they're talking to you in a certain way, way with a certain amount of compassion, but it's very professional mm. and it's and, and they kind of like to show off about what they're capable of doing and you're like is that appropriate it's a very yeah. strange realm to be in but um so yeah so we did say goodbye to Una and I had this whole lavender fields thing where I was like I need to take myself out into a lavender field to kind of release that we honestly did think that was it yeah they did yeah. number three surgery and alas she was still there in this incubator I think they did it in in NICU because they couldn't take her anywhere Probably because of the neck, I guess. Sorry. And then the next, I mean, the, the interesting thing about um, surgery on NICU babies, it was only the 90s they started anaesthetizing them. So before the 90s, they were doing surgery on preemie babies and babies because they didn't think that they could create the memory because they didn't have the language for it to express that they had a memory of this pain. What? So basically, this is really messed up. So they didn't used to, they didn't give them anaesthetic so they give them anaesthetic now to do surgery because ethically uh, you know, yeah nervous system hello like an una was una was on morphine for like a very long period of time when she was first yeah. born but i'm Generally. not sure whether they were able because she was such a tiny baby like they all are when they're premi to give her um say updates on the um anaesthetic so she was certainly on morphine but i don't know the ins and the outs of that it sounds like they had to just go in in itu and just redo some surgical intervention without taking her into official surgery, which boggles my mind. Um, yeah. There. They do a lot of it, what they call cop-side, don't they? I think to stop, um, you know, it's infection control, It's especially if they've got, was it necrotizing intracolitis or something? Yeah, that, yeah no, no, neck, yeah, no. any, yeah. And I guess for people that don't know, um, it's, as Catherine said, like a, it's a, a bug that basically eats away at the intestine and that can also spread to other um, neonatal babies. So they tend to isolate babies that have that to protect them from anything else and protect them from giving it to other kids. So I guess the the thinking of doing surgeries cot side is to keep them as contained in one place with or without neck. Do you know what I mean? To, to stop them having to go to and from... Uh, operation theatres but yeah. again those kind of operations are fast they're massively invasive they're not just you yeah. know especially with her her intestines or her organs already outside yeah. of her body energetically the navel region is like it's huge isn't it mm. like the energy center especially for <laughs> males because that's yeah. where growth womb etc exists and within yoga you know we talk about manipura brings the lower energy and the upper energy down to that area which is connected to the will which i always think is really hilarious because will power and una <laughs> she's <the strong> one <laughs> she's very strong from that energy center and well i didn't want to say anything <laughs> she's really you know she's had a lot there's a lot that she's had to because she's a defenseless baby to tolerate yeah. what they have done to, I mean, it's just beyond. And we, after her third surgery, she was left for four weeks to see if she would survive. 
because they'd done so much and they just didn't know. And as you know, sepsis is a massive thing and she was on full life support, morphine, TPN, TPN drip from the toe though. So it hadn't gone into the veins of the heart yet. It hadn't gone into the chest. So a central line, essentially Hickman line. Um, so she was just left to survive. I remember I sat there next to her incubator, not really saying anything. And there were lots of fascinating babies around us. There was one that was blind because he was so premmy. This lovely Indian father. Um, oh, James has still got his business card. Like you get, you have these connections with these people that you've not come across any other point in yeah. your life. And I honestly do believe like NICU itself is like a sacred space because you're bringing in extreme life death situations there's major grief going on yeah. you get these chaplains walking through saying you know this this is a gift this suffering kind of thing and you know you're like i get you but also <laughs> yeah i want to punch you in the face but <laughs> yeah I mean, like, <laughs> but also come and help me yeah <laughs> But like we we had this almost uh, way of I felt really very very strongly that I had to be really 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 like positive with mm. the nursing staff because I just felt that you know my daughter's life was in their hands hundred yeah. percent and they were like holding the fort at night time when I'd go home see Eddie my mum was sort of mucking in and looking after him and then he went to full time nursery which he did not go well for him he did not like that I mean it's it's affected him so a yeah. little bit of a trauma for him to have to go into like nursery full-time after being with mummy all the time I vanished yeah you know the child was born he didn't meet his sister until she was five and a half months old wow. with the um, flu risk over winter time yeah. so That's he true. had his sister he didn't it was completely mad I don't know if he realizes how mad it was but he hadn't met her and then um, obviously Una survived but it was only you know, I think April, May, that I said to the head nurse, because we didn't know and it was still going to make it, because every six hours things were thrown up and it was it was like, I don't know if she's going to live from day to day. I said, if she's not going to survive, I need her brother to meet her. So we basically stole her away up to the fifth floor and they met for the oh. first time. And, you know, this is moving forwards quite a few surgeries. She's five and a half, half months old and she's got liver failure. Her, uh, what's it called? Bilirubin. Yeah. Conjugate bilirubin bilirubin was really really high because of the tpn that was keeping yeah. her alive because she couldn't eat because she still didn't have a bowel that worked in any way shape so or she's form. kind of jaundiced by this point major jaundice i'm talking orange eyeballs yeah wow. and i'm talking floppy and yeah. orange skin skinny unbelievably skinny no baby should be skinny bald mm-hmm. from uh scalp uh the, the, hats. Yeah, yeah. the hats they have to wear because her access was so bad so the cannulation went through the skull, <sighs> like a dude. I mean, she'd be really into the shaved head vibe now. Yeah, she'd love it now. It's because she's very asymmetric with her hair. Well, she was <laughs> so cool. But she looked really ill. And I had this Mother's Day photo sent to me by the head nurse. And she was like, oh, she looks really well. I got that photo. She looks so awful. Yeah. I understand what the head nurse was talking about. <laughs> She looks so, what you, do you think she looks really well? I think she was just trying to be encouraging. Yeah, that's the epitome <laughs> of like self-fulfilling prophecies over here. It's Hi, positive, but... yeah. <laughs> super positivity gone wrong. Yeah, I mean like, oh, so, okay. No, number three surgery, left to see if she'd survive. She got sepsis loads of times and she had like a tube coming out with like a blue tea pr- Peter effect um, bit of, sort of micropore and then like biro do not remove a red tube it was like a yeah I forget the term anyway then they do number four surgery and they say I'm going to be able to do this this and this and we went to the pub to sit there it's across the road on Fulham Road and we painted our nails black to sort of you know because that's those are the nails that were black that then eventually fell off um, you know, in support of this surgery, we were like, right, okay, positivity, we can do this. Yeah. And I distinctly remember having the book that we bought that we got the name Una from. Oh. An Ian Sinclair book, a psychogeography around Hackney. It's called That Rose Red Empire. Oh. And there's an Una that's a Labour MP in there for, for Hackney. And then there's a few other Unas that have popped up. Anyway, I had that book. We had our nails painted. We were ready for that eight hours stint while we waited for her to come out of surgery. She came out of surgery having 
being given none of the options that we were given bearing in mind we were given three they couldn't do those three none of them worked every time they moved the bowel it started to die to go black and they just kept on sort of messing around with it she came out with some other concoction of a silo with Gore-Tex and like weird you know stitched together like Frankenstein wow and it was a massive tennis ball mound that came out of her gaping wound around her belly God. they had this whole thing of like I think it was with this one it could have been with the second one where we had to treat it in a certain way like it was a little ecosystem and put right. a film around it I think that was the second one though that one lasted for a period of time it didn't last very long and you've got like fungal infections to deal with sepsis to feel, deal with TPN to deal with at the same time and she's still in um, intensive care she gets to HDU and it's like, yeah, we're in HDU. We're doing really well. I depend I, it's a level down. <laughs> we can chill. Um, I've got a video of a volcanic eruption of, I was still, I was pumping mil- like milk, breast milk at this time because I felt like I needed to do that because that was hope. Um, can do though, isn't it really? So like unable to do anything else to help. Exactly. You're like, I'm just going to freeze all of this breast milk because you might be able to get one mil of it. Yeah. But if she was given one mil down her nasal gastric tube, it erupted through her volcanic Gore-Tex wow. creation. So I had a video of it, sent it straight to the um, surgeon and then they had to do another surgery and they wrapped it in something else they use in dentistry. And I think that was the one where I had to do this elaborate YouTube video. And I recorded it and <laughs> I was so mad. I was like a mad nurse. I was like, I want to learn all of this. Yeah. Sponge. I was like, I need to know all of this. I'm going to be head nurse for my daughter. Yeah. A massive team. And we're going to get through this. And if we don't yeah. get through this, we've done our best. Yeah. That's kind of my approach. So I was like, all over this. She had this whole other situation made up on her belly. And I think she had a really bad fungal infection then. And that was a really hard time. I think that's when the psychologist and some of the consultants, because we were at ward rounds like every week, Holmes and the Hannah, or under the hammer or whatever it's called, that was on in the parent room. We'd wait, we'd go into the ward round, the consultant would be taking it and there'd be the nurses and all the staff and you as the parent were meant to just listen and respect what they say. But there's little old me going, what about, how about, just, can you do this? I was to say, no, not people like us. <laughs> no, nightmare parent. And they did at one point, they went, one of them really got like, she sort of sized me up and was like, it's not time for that, Catherine. It's not. <laughs> because we basically were in emergency situations over and over yeah. again. They yeah. were pressed. They were really, really, uh, yeah, experimenting with Una. Mm. She was put into a medical journal. They were doing some crazy stuff to her, stuff that had not been done before um you know taking ideas from the um sort of bombing incidents where people have lost limbs and taking some of what they were doing up in Birmingham and trying it out on Una it was really kind of and uh yeah so I did get put in my place rightly so but I was still going to be there it didn't stop me I was still going to listen I was still going to suggest things I was still going to press them yeah. you know and um yeah so like it it took a few I think we got to like number six surgery where she finally got a stoma yeah stoma was a t-shaped t-bend with all the cuts you know because there was hardly any left um and it flopped out of the front of this big you know like a whole of the front of her belly had been cut into over and over and over again just pulled open and we were asking it to you know heal and also allow for this big kind of sort of dead end bit of intestine to stay and it wasn't was it so it was pushing out pushing out we were making body suits this was another blue peter mode where i was making these body suits out of bits of foam bits of micro cutting holes in doing a design showing the nurses i did that every single day i would turn up at like 9 30 10 o'clock in the morning I would do her body suit. We'd clean it all down. We used um, Manuka honey. It's amazing. Such a good shell. Like they, that's what they decided to use. And after six weeks, we got a ward round and the consultant said, this is what happens when you do it right. And they were like nice. healed. The skin is healed around the stoma. It was all shiny, shiny new wow. skin. And we were like, right. Okay. She's ready for another surgery. We'll cut straight into that clean skin. Yeah. 
Ugh. reconnect her reconnect her bow and they did number seven they reconnected her bow and she I made us some little bloomers out of liberty print fabric that were oh. tiny and <laughs> to celebrate but she could let some co it's not it wasn't really poo it was more meconium yeah let her use her anus for the first time oh. You know, like I was, I it was huge for me because at that time they weren't. Wearing, she wasn't wearing clothes, and I was cutting up baby suits, and making crop tops oh. around the massive dome around the front of her body. Oh. So after number seven surgery, I was able to do skin. To, well, I say skin to skin. I wasn't stripping off, but holding my baby chest to chest for the first mm. time. How after, that. That, after all of that, I got to hold her. Because I wasn't holding her. I was, she was on her back for the rest of the time, you know, like it's not the same. At the beginning, you're allowed to put your hand around the head and the feet. And you're doing almost like Reiki with your newborn baby because yeah. you can't get them out of the incubator. Yeah. So I was just waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting to be able to hold her. So that, co- I mean, that contact, as you know, that's so important. It's huge. It's critical. They're in, they're in your body, for God's sake. And then they're not in your body. And then you yeah. can't even hug the baby um it's astonishingly difficult to get your head around that and ethically it was so awful I did get to a point where I was like we've got beyond what is ethically like fair on this Mm. child this being to carry on like this I honestly did I got to that point where I was like I don't think we can carry on because it's been you know it's been impossible but what are the other options well, yeah, I mean, like, what I, because I, but I was getting to that point, of course, ethically, you just carry on, you carry on, ca- you carry on. But I, you know, I was getting to that point where I was like, I don't think this is helpful mm. anymore because we're not getting anywhere. No. You know, that was Christ, that was kind of crisis point. I almost mm. like we've given so much and all of you guys have been trying. It was just, it was just far too much for me. And I think I started, that was when one of the consultants said to me, oh, you should start doing like a blog. And I started focusing my energy on like the documentation of what was going on. Yeah. So, you know, because I was photographing everything, you know, and I've got some really grotesque photos that are a bit like the kids shouldn't really have to, you know, see them. But when they're looking at photographs, like, mommy, what are they? And so don't look at them. <laughs> just don't. Just but not. at the same time, it's part of it's part of them. It's their their history. It's oh, part of you know who their sister is. It's part of who she is. It's part of how you guys have got to where you are. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I, I know what you mean. They're, they're probably very graphic and they're probably you know really harrowing. But mm-hmm. I guess I would assert that that's necessary for them to understand how you've got to be here. What has actually kind of happened what's going on that's been really crucial to una's understanding of who she is yeah you know so she has she eats now it took it took her three years to come off her full uh tpn oh. life side of things and that's that's not surprising that's got to be i mean it's, you know it's astonishing in the eyes of the medical profession they are like how have you done this yeah because a lot of her peers haven't yeah you know, cause so her contemporaries that came up, because Una was like the oracle on Niku. I promise you, she was there for such a long time. People yeah. knew who Una was. They knew which room she was in. People would go in and see her to get a smile. Wow. Like she had all these nurses flocking around her, singing to her. Because she was so know, gorgeous. You know, <laughs> and um, they would come and sing to her and then they'd come and give her a lumbar puncture. <laughs> and yeah, I love those ones. Blood. You know, like talk about scrambling the nervous system. Yeah. You know, and actually, you know, if you fast forward until she was three, she was so paranoid when she was three. And I know exactly what it was because I've had the hospice lady that did some art stuff, therapy with me. We had these conversations. It was like, of course. But because she had this, oh, you know, smiley, smiley, joyful, joyful, m- massive, intrusive, painful situation. That was her normal yeah. And her body held on to that. So when we'd be walking down the village high street and an old couple would smile at her from across the road, she would start screaming and be like, why are they, why? She could be threatened. Yeah. She was completely threatened by it. She was on high alert. And there was her trauma. We were in Waitrose in the cafe and there was this lovely couple sitting there and she freaked out yeah. and she was really angry because she felt threatened. And yeah. from perspective was like that's not a threatening situation they're smiling at you 
yeah what's going on yeah like, well no it's conditioned into her and she's still experiencing that she's still trying to get over the fact like faces they did some work with her in year one about faces because an ambiguous face looked like a threatening face to her right her cortisol levels are sky high that's why she's like zero to a hundred but mainly mainly a hundred yeah not much in between yeah but that is her that's going to be the thing to work on for her it's going to be self-soothing yeah. self-regulation yeah. all the way like it is for many of us yeah but I think but it's, it's the hardest and I think I don't know I'm it's, hmm, I should be doing research into this I guess you know maybe you have but I wonder what the levels are of kids that have been in intensive care situations special care situations high high um dependency situations that mm. come out with more diagnosed mental health issues and if yeah. that's higher I know that they said to us that like kids that were on high levels of oxygen for a longer period of time tended more to have like ADHD because yeah. of you know the the level of brain activity and the sustained level of brain activity so I see that but I guess from what you're saying it just kind of made me think well I wonder if there is that correlation of, you know, the, the trauma that they're carrying and how how that can be, if that can be rectified, you know? Yeah, I think it's def there's definitely going to be a cor correlation, but I wonder if there has been much, uh, there's definitely been some things written about it because the community paediatrician that saw us when it was COVID, so it was not a good time at all, Mm -hmm. so she was like I've I've written a PhD in premature births and the effect that has on exactly what you're saying on ASD on ADHD love to read it she yeah. also knew our consultant um uh Krishna syndrome who's like part of our family because mm -hmm. he's been involved with Una's care since day one and honestly you can't you can't replicate that relationship that you have with the people that were there when your baby was little you yeah. can't like we came here and we thought Addenbrooke's their specialist. That's why we moved here, about half an hour emergency from the specialist hospital. But the relationship with Addenbrooke's, we went in there for a few emergencies and stuff and they sort of signed us off and were like, it's a miracle, she's amazing. But, and, and she was the lady, the consultant was so sort of like, what you've done is incredible. And I'm just like, you don't understand that it's not finished yet. Yeah. <laughs> We're not out of the woods is what yeah. I was thinking. I was like, yeah, she's not on TPN anymore. And that's amazing. She doesn't have a Hickman line, which was also amazing because then she won't yeah. get liver failure. But all the other stuff, <laughs> you know, like we can deal with the stuff that's on the surface because it's like, is she alive? Is she not? What's going on? The failure of organs. Mm -hmm. But the emotional um, uh, fallout from that and it's after the it's when we move when a family moves into a safe space where they're not dealing with emergencies all the time that is when everyone has to deal with the stuff yeah right when you move into safety and you realize hang on a second yeah. right professionals have all disappeared into the background we're now alone how do we navigate this yeah and that is that's massive and we moved here you know, when she was coming off PN, we were a bit sort of at the grandparents in this kind of transition period, leaving the professionals behind in London was huge for me. And I can't, I, I didn't have the foresight really to realise that that was going to have such an impact on me. But I was so reliant on my, like, they were beautiful, wonderful team. This Irish lady, they, she gave us the Velveteen Rabbit when we left and she she was just gorgeous. And she cycled over to the house. It was the the team that was involved and the wider kind of aspect of the support mm. with Shoot the Stars and the Rainbow Trust. We had this key worker um, type lady with the Rainbow Trust called Fiona. Mm -hmm. She was an absolute legend. She took Eddie on the London Eye. Oh. Things like that, because yeah. we had respite carers and we were still doing three nights respite, res respite in the evenings because of the pumps and three respite carers during the day it was really crazy because we had all these people in and out of the door and um and then we moved here and we had kind of a replicated situation with respite carers but it just felt really desolate oh. it felt so desolate and I didn't feel like I had any of that connection and support that I had before 
it was really hard. And I remember one of the respite carers came to look after Una, took her to the playground, came back. She said, there were people in the playground and they know, knew who Una was, but no one said hello. They just stared at us. And I was like, oh my God. Are you kidding? <laughs> you know, like I just, we were trying to like, I guess we were trying to settle in, but it was really, really difficult to do that because yeah. we were so other. We're just like, you know, there were too many others. Someone would, you know, they'd ask you why, why we moved and I'm like, well, we moved for the hospital and this situation and people didn't know what to say and they didn't know how to react and they didn't know how to be so they just leave you alone and it's like mm. well you know we've had some hard times but I could do with talking about it <laughs> yeah. you know all my guts because that's yeah. how we work as humans and that's how we connect isn't it as we share and I think that's how you and I connected you know kind of for anybody listening like our children aren't the same age I think they might have gathered that by now and you know we are I, I don't know we got talking at school I think and you know kind of spoke to maybe let's do Katie with maybe mm, having York. yes having Wilf, I think. Wilf. yeah that's yeah, probably yeah. how it was and then yeah sort of you know looking after Wilf and looking after Una um and then as you do you get talking about oh the kids are everywhere and oh this is a bit of a nightmare and also and oh well early babies and no really and you know and then you kind of understand that you might have been in you know different places different situations but you're very much linked by your experience because yeah. this is still ongoing this is still we're still having the conversations about the school system we're still having the conversations about you know diagnoses and labeling and about siblings and all of these things that haven't just come from an early baby you know these are things that are going to continue throughout their lives and throughout our lives and yeah. I think like when you say you know the pictures for me I was always very gung-ho about being there at any kind of procedure because I didn't want there to be any unanswered questions I didn't want there to be any blank pages for Jay mm -hmm. in the same way as you have with Una yeah totally you know and you're the only person that can can provide that you know you, even if you go and get the I think one of my friends had a after thoughts or after it's probably called aftercare but after thoughts um you know discussion where you can go and sit and go through your notes with somebody but they weren't the people that were involved. These mm. are people that are just reading through your notes with you. So yeah, you missed a gap. Wrong. <laughs> yeah. Ours, our discharge letter was four or five pages long. I've got photographs. That four I or like. five pages. Yeah. That was it. Yeah. Like, well, this is, I think. <laughs> Apart it was, from all the novels that you had in the hospital or the stats. That was after NICU. So you have your six and a half months moving from NICU to pediatrics because we didn't really, we got to like go up to university instead oh, yeah. Irene, which was downstairs in mercury ward and i checked through they're like i was like you've missed that one you've missed that you've forgotten about that it mentioned the suspected uh sort of oh it was horrible after seven of those surgeries she then got really really floppy and poorly and it was basically um suspected bacterial meningitis oh, we couldn't lose her again she was um they ripped the hickman line out I think it was actually sepsis from the line that got up to her brain. She wasn't fed because she didn't have a line. She just had drip feed liquids for a week. And I think she lost a lot of weight and she wasn't responsive for that period of time. We thought she was brain damaged. Oh. But she had a scan of her brain and they said there was cerebral atrophy mm -hmm. on one side of the hemispheres. And I was like, I want to know exactly what that is and yeah. what that is. And they were like, well, we'd have to look at specific, we'd have to ask a neurosurgeon, you know. I'm, that. I'm, look at that right and I'm like, yes, yeah, I want that. You yeah, know, how so have you given that information yeah. and not like yeah. backed it up? I'm because I'm like, give me what you can and I'll go run with it and I'll find out, you know, so I'll, I'll yeah. look it up because I, I want to know what that is, what that imp how that impairs things. Yeah. She, I mean, she did recover to a certain extent, but you know, men meningitis that it does affect the brain and this is why I've changing. flagged up the stuff because I know you know she's with you know at home I know what she's like and the period of time when she went to sort of preschool she went to one preschool um that you know was really quite good with SDN and one school preschool that I'd say was not really set up for that at all and um you know the one that was set up for it was the lady who'd been in the job for like 20 30 40 years and she was amazing she didn't treat Una differently she just seemed to kind of understand what I'm saying 
but it wasn't the case always with all of the situations we were in, you know. Um, and then she started school and it was just, you know, from, from day one of being at preschool, it was a nightmare. It was an absolute nightmare. She couldn't tolerate with being like being around other children. It was yeah. too much. Their energies, like it was triggering. She couldn't settle. She wouldn't go in. She wouldn't go into school. Teacher wouldn't just let me take her to the office. She wanted to go the normal way because I think she thought that Una was just very willful. Yeah. You know, it's this confusing the labeling. It's like she's just very will willful and she just needs to know her place or something. And actually, that was really unhelpful. And then year after year after year at school was just absolutely horrendous and throughout right. that whole time I was like do I send her in, to another school do I homeschool her you know um it really had an effect on me and my sort of oh, just that sort of sense of being a parent mm. and um when you see everyone and this is how it feels when you feel like that it's like everyone is great fine and then there's you <laughs> with the screaming children in the street couldn't even get the buggy when they're really little I was trying to get the buggy around fountain lane which was notoriously difficult to get around the corner and I had a fill and Ted's and it would crash into the bloody road it would fall over it would literally tip over and you know Una would literally just be whatever she was doing at the time and I, I couldn't cope and yeah. I remember the very few times like you do when someone shows up and they're like I see you yeah and they can help yeah and not often enough but yeah. when that happens, I remember certain people have been through their own stuff recently, um, just coming and helping without even, they're like, I, you know, I have four, uh, I'll take the buggy. And you're like, thank you so much. Right. <laughs> that kindness, yeah. more acts of kindness yeah. are everything. You just don't know what's going on in someone's life. Yeah. And how, you just can't know. And I do think that those of us who have been through serious suffering, we see that clearly yeah I think we sort of step up maybe a little bit more I hope so I don't know if I'm stepping up for other people to be honest but oh my I, God. you so I, are I am you know so are so yeah and those moments are clear as day to me yeah they were like the moments in NICU like the moments where you have a conversation with a nurse and you have some banter over water coming out of a tap because the nurse is about to go to Alice Springs in Australia and you just have a moment of connection and those moments stay forever yeah. in you, yeah. you know? So, yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's, that is, that's where I come from as a yoga teacher. That is everything. It's connection. It's like, I see you, let go of that. It's okay. Mm. This is safe. You know, like life throws up so much stuff. You just need to chill with the stuff, the small stuff. Yeah. Because the big stuff is huge. And I'm talking life and death is yeah. huge, right? That is this, that's the hard stuff. And we are all, I mean, this is, it's very preachy, but life is suffering, right? Yeah. Yeah. 100%. We just have to sort of accept that because that suffering can be used for the greater good and it can be used as fuel internally. And a lot of the yoga practices are kind of incorporating that. We use that suffering, that um, pressure within us to move beyond like the limitations so yeah and I like my my the process that I've been through has been to heal myself like the yoga teacher I would have been pre-una would have been slightly different I would have been back bend back bend shakrasana let's do it jumping just so much energy like <laughs> you know like a rabbit on Duracell batteries I was ridiculous <laughs> And I do wonder, actually, because I was doing a lot of twists like a guinea pig at that time, how that impacted Una. But obviously you can't go into that realms of what you did as no. a parent to create that situation where that happens. Because it's a, an endless spiral if you get into that. It is. But, it's you know, it's a natural one. And mm. I mentioned on my version of the podcast, like the the fact of being able to work through those things and acknowledge what emotions come up and mm work towards letting them go is yeah. is massive and you have to I think you know it's mm. only my opinion you have to do that because otherwise you come from this place of grief you your identity is grief your identity is loss and trauma and lack and that's that's destructive you know you internalize everything and consequently that is the energy that you give off to everyone else so mm. at some point you have to 
like you say, you know, I'm, I might have done this and I might have done that. I can't know that any of that stuff did or didn't have mm. any impact on that pregnancy at the time. But mm. what I know is I can't do anything about that. So I've got to release that. I've got to, you know, forgive myself for yeah. that kind of emotion and move forward. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because those situations present themselves. It's like, you know, the universe has a, doesn't have a plan, but, you know, something presents itself. Yeah. And that's for you to rise up to and hopefully rise above it. Yeah. But it's so it's so difficult to get to that point. Yeah. And it can take so much time to get to that point. Yeah. Whether you're overwhelmed, exhausted, um, malnourished yourself. Huge. Like you know, my mum had to just force, she was like trying to feed me throughout this process with yeah. doing because that kind of got thrown out the window. Oh yeah, no self-care. There's no time. Yeah. Like seriously. <laughs> I'm not hungry. I'm really stressed. I'm trying yeah. to keep the low. You know, yeah. it's a bit like that. Um, and you you go through, it's like a marathon. You have to be prepared for those sort of situations to a certain extent. Like I, I feel that if I hadn't given myself a break and by all means, you know, I'm teaching yoga, but I'm so aware of my, you know, it's the analogy of how many spoons you've got. I'm mm -hmm. so aware of my energy levels. I'm so aware of how easy it is for me to go beyond what I'm capable of doing because I kind of have that tendency to just push yeah. you know and to not be aware of my the sensations so it's part of my practice it's part of the way I teach it comes from a very authentic place and like only since you know I had COVID before Christmas quite late compared to everyone else I was well I was ill I was really ill I was in bed for about 14 days then ended up in hospital wow. and that was such um a light bulb moment for me because mm -hmm. I don't think I take my body for granted fully but to a certain extent I was because I wasn't trying to harness the potential I had really so since I recovered from COVID I've gone back to like things that I did that made me who I was when I was sort of you know beyond like before I was 10 years old mm -hmm. so I when I was a kid was like a mermaid basically I was an app I loved water I yeah. you know yeah. I learned to swim my gran taught me to swim and she also taught a lady who's 70 years older to swim and then all these people in between like my yeah. mom was an absolute legend um I learned to swim when I was four in Mauritius lucky me check it out I love it well I'm like a fish since and then did the usual thing and you know like in in my primary school years I did galas and things but I was never really that fast because I used to get really stressed and anxious mm. and um but I could swim forever like just let me swim and I'll just swim for hours on end and I'll just and then I'm I'm happy like yeah. you're completely absorbed in that you know rhythm and it's wonderful and I came to realize that that's something I needed to kind of bring back into my life mm. so even though I knew that I should have you know like I, I wasn't actually applying myself yeah. I was really focused on the yoga and I was doing a little bit of cold water swimming here and there over the past few years but so regularly now like every week I, I, go, I go swimming and I just really enjoy it I tend to go on my own I look at the time I swim a bit I work on my breathing, I work on my pranayama breath holds and I get into this rhythm and it was really funny, like I'm 37 now, I've never been as fit or as aware of my, or the rhythm really, like in my life, mm -hmm. you know, in my 20s, I didn't do anything like that, I was just fixed on like the art world and drinking and being in London and all that stuff, you know, yeah. and Teens, I didn't I gave up swimming because I wanted to have a social life I didn't want to go to galas because they're at the weekend and I wanted yeah. to you know do all that because <laughs> so it's, it's not about health benefits is it it's <laughs> I mean it's like um for me like I think I was very aware of maybe the chronic fatigue and maybe the complex PTSD that might mm. be in body like might be in my body is likely to be in my body after what we've been exactly. through um sort of slightly self-diagnosed um you know I, I don't think it's unreasonable to self-diagnose that though I think that's yeah. just part of the course I, really. I could spend about three grand on some therapy and they can tell me that but I think it's already you know I, I'm you do you trust your friend that you've discussed these things with and just take the fact that I'll diagnose you'll be fine <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll diagnose you from my coach world how's that <laughs> of the books that I've got about <laughs> six years 
um yeah yeah you just you just sort of know don't you after a period of time um but yeah I think I'm I've definitely so eight years on I'm so much more on top of my should we self safe we can say self-care I feel like it's overused because it's massive it's more than that right yeah it's a lot more than self-care it's the ability to be able to be in the present moment yeah it's huge yeah you know rather than just being ahead and in the past like in the future and the past and being very split in terms of just not being able to ground I've yeah. had you know like I remember being here in those early days with three young kids and I'd shake I'd literally shake in certain mm-hmm. situations like I couldn't be with certain um people some I tried really hard when we moved here to try and like link Eddie up and stuff with people that really didn't understand where I was coming from mm-hmm. and one mom said to me are you on are you on drugs or are you drunk how rude so I was I really had to step back from that situation and go you know what I need to just I can't deal with that I was trying so hard to be friendly I was trying so hard to be friendly and I was it was just so brutally honest it was quite astonishingly honest I was I, I, I just I was like what, what are you talking about you know how dare she cast her aspersions on you you believe that and it was I was just I mean you better tell maybe, me that, maybe that was my case I, I don't know <laughs> <laughs> you tell me who that is I'll still put that right <laughs> I can't believe that. I was like, okay, so I need to tone it down. I need to stop smiling at people because if you smile at people too much, they think you're on some sort of, um, you know, they think you're weird. No, we've discussed this. You're a Suffolk person. That's the difference. Yeah, it's, <laughs> a, it's a Suffolkness. That's a we whole other podcast, which anyone. clearly we have to come back to. <laughs> well, yeah, it is the Suffolk in us. It's and definitely, it's definitely, definitely like just there are definite adjustments that sometimes yeah. seem to need to be made when you move to a different area yeah. like this country is fascinating you move London is miles away we're not even that far away from London in Cambridgeshire yeah. but culturally we are a million miles away yeah. from the intense kind of dynamic of Londonness. and then Suffolk is another world entirely mm-hmm. uh, Norfolk mm-hmm I don't know if that's less so now because people are everywhere but I definitely feel that and I'm I'm you know my roots have gone down I'm thankfully six years in I feel like I've got roots yes. I feel finally I have roots here which is amazing I feel like I've I'm accepting well maybe I'm not sure the the landscape has an appropriate <laughs> acceptance but like it's okay like I you know last year when we were doing this cold water immersion plunging myself into the river cam that I was putting roots down like this is my spirit animal don't worry I don't really believe it's my spirit animal but the heron was always there for me like for me he was there standing there um it's a very like putting yourself in water Mm. in lakes in rivers is such a healing thing um and I you know I was in Cornwall over the half term some complex stuff was being resolved in me having conversations with my parents about something I won't go into it too deeply. And I was taking myself into the sea and swimming. You know, I put my wetsuit on, to be fair, because I haven't got a lot of blubber on me. Yeah. So I know my limits. But I was swimming out deeper than I've ever swum on my own. At one point, the dog was on the beach and I felt like it was okay because there was someone in case I was in trouble. But a lot of the time I was going down to the beach on my own. No one was there. If something went wrong, that's it. It's just no, Catherine doesn't turn, turn up. But I felt so secure in myself. It was so safe. I was like, I know this bay. I've been in this bay. My grand swam in this bay decades and decades back. Like I'm I'm being held. Mm. It's like going back to the womb. I'm being held in this water. We came from the sea. Like it was a really beautiful moment for me. It was kind of like an epiphany. And I find that, I do honestly find that every single time I go back to the water and I can be in a swimming pool. Yeah. It's and it's cleansing. It's it's incredible. And you can develop strength through that process to build and build when you're well. I mean, that's the crucial thing. I think if you've got chronic fatigue, if you've got autoimmune things, you kind of need to get to a base point yeah. like wellness before you can build and build and build because otherwise you just end up overdoing it. Um yeah I'm I'm there now and I'm gaining strength and I feel that strength in my body 
and I've never been more able to do those things which is lovely like that's so nice to be stronger than you are when you're 20 or 25 or 30. Yeah. If I keep going like with that amount of stress I do honestly believe that I probably have cancer by now yeah you know or the joke was can you send me to the asylum so I can have a break. <laughs> honestly it's true it is true um, you know our, our nervous systems break down before we give in you know mm. we push and push and push and I think so many of us when we have lives with extra stuff or we have children with extra needs or you know we're we're under pressure from work or family or you know financial stress all of those things psychological stress mm. our, our bodies will allow us to keep going to a point our brains will want to keep pushing us further than we can and yeah. at some point if we don't yeah step back mm. we crumble and yeah. that choice is taken away from us so I think you're right you have to and I, I know what you mean about self-care the the terminology I mean maybe we should start calling it like holistic care you know the mm. the overall mind body nervous system psychological somatic you know every mm. kind of element yeah. of us a whole take on caring for ourselves past present future you know Absolutely. maybe that's kind of a, a different way of of thinking about it yeah. but I think it's important I think it is important to to take that step um consciously out and yeah. have a a time out for ourselves exactly it's um time to connect isn't it because I think yeah. self-care in some ways I feel like it's like going and having a mark, like a face mask or something, you know, putting <laughs> my yeah. sister back some masks from South Korea and I put one on yesterday. And I'm like, it's, it's not about <laughs> face mask on. Yeah, it's, it's not a plaster, is it? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's got to be. I mean, I'm a big fan of baths and <laughs> will laugh about my my bath, my bathing habits. Like I need to bathe less because I get a bit eczema in the winter. So I need to stop going into the water. Yeah, no, I'm always in the shower, same thing. <laughs> my granddad would call up and go you in the shower again and I have to start, I was like 16 I'm always in the shower mate <laughs> it's just the water though isn't it it's that it's that therapy yeah. you know it, it makes sense I think to people that have that connection to it yeah absolutely I mean like I just uh my my very basic way of doing things at the moment is to if I've got time extend the collection from school which no longer is so bad as bad as it used to be I will go and walk up to the peak of the clunch pit, <laughs> the <laughs> highest point that I can find. It's like Love a few it. meters up. <laughs> it's not very, but then, you know, you're walking into that and you're like, oh, it's a bit like I'm in Scotland or something. Yeah. <laughs> that's my happy place. If you lose me, that's where I am. Like, it's I'll just sit up there for hours. It can be something. It can be an unexpected whatever on the yeah. floor. Yeah. Um, it doesn't have to be a, a drastic kind of life-changing event. It can be... I don't know we don't have orchids up there at the moment but whatever that small thing is yeah. or a connection with a monk jack and the monk jack hasn't run away from you but it's standing there and you're like yeah you know like we're, yeah. we're kind of the same <laughs> you know because they have a very kind of responsive nervous system to fight or flight run off to protect themselves so if that monk jack is just standing there obviously doesn't think that you're a threat yeah. and I think it's quite beautiful if you can have that moment with creatures with nature occasionally or daily like I think that's keep keeping a lot of us going a lot of the time yeah definitely I agree I think you know nature is super important for us to make sure that we get out there and reconnect not just with the animals and with the world around us but with ourselves um and I think in turn that helps us to reconnect with each other so hopefully going forward we can help our children to connect with themselves and with each other and process the things yeah. that they've been through in a healthy way. Big thing in terms of that recently for me is, and, and this is an interesting thing with dogs as well, isn't it? You find mm. your ground, you literally find your ground, you take your energy down and you're like, you've got this. You do that with your kids. It kind of works as well because they have amazing... Oh, yeah extra sense you know their senses are in tuned and a lot of that um kind of nervous system dysregulation I do wonder if it's because they're picking up lots of stuff that us adults haven't resolved hugely yeah so that's quite difficult in school situations isn't it because it's complicated and yeah. it's stuff parents so it's like 
Okay, so I'm coming from a space of uh, nourishment, and then I have space to be able to take on some of, not take it on, but hold space. So I'm doing a lot of holding space for Una, and that goes well sometimes, and then sometimes not so well. Yeah. And again, that depends on how many spoons I've got. So you know, I can if I can if I don't overdo it, it's absolutely fine. But to be able to navigate the things that they are expressing is huge. And to remember that actually they're expressing something that just seems very important for them in that moment. It's not a clear idea of the whole day that they've had. Yes. It's a selected amount of things they need to express to you. And sometimes they think they're expressing what mummy wants to hear. And actually it's not what mummy needs to hear or wants to hear. Yeah. Daddy gets a different story. Oh, yeah. It's, it's interesting. <laughs> So there's a lot going on with an eight-year-old girl. Um, it's different to the boys. And trying to navigate that and to hold space for her and say, how about if you were that person, or maybe they're finding this tricky mm. and give her other perspectives and not trying to weigh those ideas down with more weight. Yeah. There's a lot of that. And a lot of, I don't know if I'm hearing from her, for instance, that she's hearing from friends or other kids what their parents are expressing at home you do wonder how much of that is going on and so I don't much. I, I'm not going to go oh so and so is this or so and so is that because no way am I going to try and like um I don't know create even more separation when they're trying to figure out what's going on in life and we need yeah. to give them the tools to figure that out and also model what it's like to be an adult that adults don't go around talking about people behind their backs yeah um and saying so and so is doing this so and so is doing that it's not about that it's about collaborating and talking to each other and being kind yeah and I think you're right you know and I, I guess this brings it nicely kind of round to where we started which is that moving through our kids development moving through each eventual stage that we'll go through with them we're going to have to find new ways of dealing with these issues mm -hmm. with, with their stuff with yeah. our stuff you know and the whole point of the the collective movement that's happening at the moment in the the coaching the yoga the um you know the the breath the breathwork kind of world it's about healing our stuff so our kids don't have to and I think we are going to get different perspectives of our kids our kids are going to get different things from us as we move but our job is to kind of manage that mm -hmm. together as we move with each other and support each other and that was the whole point of the podcast that's the the whole point of us connecting um mm -hmm. and I'm so overjoyed that you agreed to come on today because I I love talking to you anyway as you know mm -hmm. But I really think you give a, another dimension to things and I love hearing your experiences. Um, and I would love for you, to, if you would like to, to come back and maybe share kind of the next stage of discussion about how you've experienced schooling or, you know, how you are experiencing the joys of having boys and girls and how you're managing that kind of dynamic. Um, because so many people listening can can relate to those topics too. Yeah, and I've so enjoyed listening to people talk on this so far. I think it's so nice to have that held space for open, honest conversation. You know, all flaws, all in, you know imperfections out. Because seriously, it's mm -hmm. not we're not seeing the whole story, are we? And sometimes we need to hear the honest truth. Like we we're all just trying to figure it out day by day. Yeah, you no, know. and no one's any more well equipped than anyone else <laughs> so. yeah and we you know we're in it together basically we always we're, we're you know all of us should just be supporting one another 100 percent. couldn't have said it better myself thank you Catherine. i really appreciate you and please come back i'd love to have you on again wonderful thank you so much chick